Think Tech Hawaii. Civil engagement lives here. Hi, welcome to Seymour's World on ThinkTech Hawaii. Uh, a couple of weeks ago, we had probably one of the most interesting shows that Seymour's World has had in four, four and a half years. And we had Paige Davis on the show. And she talked about her journey, her journey through her cancer, how she went through it, what enabled her to have a better, better lifestyle during that period of time. And something hit me. We all know that family, friends are very, very supportive. But she had somebody else. She had a man named Flint Sparks, who is a Zen teacher, a psychologist. He's, a, he's, a, he's probably one of the most mentoring persons I have met. And I am so lucky that this man has moved from Austin, Texas to Molokai very recently, and he is here to join us today. So we're going to talk to Flint about meditation, about life, about journeys, about love, about breaking barriers, all these things that I hope we can get in this one. One session. If not, we'll do another one. So may I introduce you to Flint. Flint, welcome to Thank you for having me on the show. This is wonderful and great to follow Paige. Well, what a pleasure, not just to meet you, because I know how much of an influence you are on Paige's journey, yeah. but also because you're influencing me so much on my journey of life. And I think it's, it's critical that uh, we as individuals understand that support is so important. It's essential. So tell us a little bit about what you do. Well, I have been, as you mentioned earlier, um, in the, my sort of former life, as it were, a psychologist and a psychotherapist for nearly 40 years. And during that time, I had a specialty in which I worked a lot with people who had severe medical illnesses, especially cancer, hence my relationship with, with Paige. And over the time, uh, those years, I also began to, mm, because of the request of those uh, people who were ill, questions of their deepest soul there. I wanted to respond to them, not in a religious way, but to those spiritual levels. And so I began to train in, um, in Buddhism and meditation and um, so that I could offer something deeper. So now I lead retreats, teach, write, and do things like this. Well, you know, coming on to Seymour's world for me is an honor. It's an honor to have you here because I think it's so important that we have shared so much. Just in a few minutes before, when I first met you, we share so much of the same value systems. Sure. And the value of appreciating life the way it is and making sure that you can pass that on to others has become a key motivator in my life. And you said that's exactly the way you think, too. Absolutely. Uh, because I've worked <clears throat> as a psychotherapist, and if you look at a lot of the research on what predicts happiness and well-being for adults. One of the most robust predictors from research is secure attachment for the infant. Someone that's there to love them, to be with them, to care for them. At the end of life, my other big work of my life, I hear people saying, you know, at the end, nothing really matters that much except was I loved and did I love well? Well, if love is the most important thing in the beginning, and it's the most important thing at the end, it seems like uh, that might be something to focus on for the entirety of life. How do we care for each other? How do we allow care from each other? How do we connect in a way that humans really require for health and well-being and happiness? I think, uh, I think you've answered a big question. Oh, What is the most important part of your life? And if the word is love, to be loved and to also give love, I think that, of course, love is, has many, many pieces sure, to it. Sure. But that in itself is such a great legacy for all of us yeah. to live by. You know, can you be loved by all the people that you've affected? And can people love you for everything that you have done in your life? Well, th those, are, th those are big, broad things. But we, what we, we know is that if, if you're operating from your sort of deepest, truest self, then probably what's going to come forward is something that has some integrity and some truth and some clarity and some kindness and some compassion. Those qualities come forward naturally when our reactivity and our fear relaxes. 
I think you're right. I think uh, one of the other things that I wanted to discuss with you is the ability to show gratitude. Uh, yeah. Those of you out there who have seen my show over the years know that gratitude is one of my most important pieces in my life, especially now, mm -hmm. Flint, because I mentioned to you I have cancer, yes. and I'm living with it. And uh, believe it or not, I'm enjoying life more today than I did two years ago when I was when I was diagnosed with cancer. You know, I, I really didn't allow the negativity to mm -hmm. come into my life, so I'm uh, I have as full a life as possible. Uh, for 18 hours a day and I do what I want to do. That word gratitude, tell me what that means to you. Well, I, I think the uh, capacity to view life through a, a lens of what's possible, what's available, what's present, rather than what's missing, what you hoped would be, in those ways you become smaller, more self-contained, more self-centered. Is it what I want? Is it all about me? But if you open to what's available, uh, you find that life is, is remarkable. And there are many, many gifts that are being given to us all the time, even if they're a gift that you wouldn't suspect, like your cancer, would make a difference. Here, here's something that people don't believe. I've worked for, like I said, 35 years with people with cancer, mostly quite severe. And people will say, so what's the main thing you hear? And they expect me to speak about uh, fear, difficulties. I say, well, you won't believe me. They say, come on, what, what is it? I said, over and over, I hear some version of this. Cancer is a terrible thing. I wish I didn't have it. I, I wouldn't want it on anyone. And it's probably the best thing that's ever happened to me. Some because version, it makes you appreciate life more? Some version of, because this opened me, it turned me, it woke me up, it did something so that a lot of the smaller ways that I was caught or contracted began to fall away. You're right. Paige talked about that in her book. Yeah. Yeah, she was very, very emphatic, actually, about the idea that the cancer actually helped her in understanding her own life, this what is her story. journey was. Yeah. I we never thought about it that way. You know, we call it in Zen, since I'm a Zen priest and teacher, uh, that spirituality is about the great matter of birth and death, this amazing reality of existential existence. Mm -hmm. And when we have a diagnosis in our world, that's the, the kind of wake up call. That's mm -hmm. the, like, oh, okay, I really have to pay attention to this, not will I get the next job? Will I get a better car? Will I have a better husband or wife? Uh, those things may come and go, and they do come and go. Mm -hmm. Everything's impermanent. Right. But what doesn't come and go amongst all the things that change, and that's that heartfelt sense of gratitude of being alive and appreciating your aliveness. Isn't it funny that it takes something as strong as maybe getting hit by a car or, or, yeah, or a literally. cancer or something, you know, <laughs> yeah. that makes you realize, am I ever lucky to be alive today? And, and really, that's the, the, the spiritual question. What wakes us up to saying, oh, I'm going to go beyond what it means just to develop myself as a material functional human being. How can I open to the, that greater space wow. of spirit and of the ineffable, of uh, that which is sort of inconceivable? And that place, we open to awe, and then we can be the recipients of grace. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. I, I think it's it's inspiring for all of us to sit here and listen to you. I feel like a, I'm a student in a classroom. No. <laughs> well, I am because you know, for me, I, I I try to do what you do in my way. You know, I do Absolutely. it in my foundation with mm -hmm. my Make Them Smile program for the kids the in the kids, hospital. Yeah. I do it with the foster kids. I do it with Holocaust teaching. That is the gratitude that I feel and I get from the kids. I I read you a letter before from yes. from a kid in school uh, who just uh, said that I made a difference to them. You know. Right. That in itself. And when I get those, I know oh, I feel so satisfied. Me too. Me it's, too. it's an amazing, uh, and rather than feeling um, like an, an ego nourishment, it's actually more humility. It's like if I'm able to do that, then I want to offer more. See, that's the thing. It, it cultivates generosity. You want to offer more. You want to grab more. So the circle gets a lot bigger. Right? And it's more, you become more humble in the face of it, mm -hmm. not more egotistical. Mm -hmm. That makes you open to more gratitude. And so humility, generosity, and gratitude begin to flow together rather than an egotistical kind of separation or uh, small selfhood that you can. It's, uh, it's interesting that you say that because I, as you know, am very busy with all the stuff that yeah. I do. And it all comes and stems from the need of gratitude. 
Yes. The need to, I, I feel like I get more out of it when I'm in the hospital mm -hmm. playing for the kids, for instance, with our musicians. I get more out of it than the kids do. I know they get a lot out of it. Of course. It. The patients, but you're fed the by it, aren't you? But man, do I get something when I see a parent putting their arm around the child and there's tears coming down their yeah. eyes because they see their kids smiling again. Yep. Yeah. Nothing beats that. And that smile may be the, the best thing. That's right. One of my teachers would say, most of us, if we get what we want or we feel like we're satisfied, then we think, then I'll be happy. This is no. Open yourself to gratitude and then see what's around you. Start with gratitude. Gratitude doesn't come just from being happy. Gratitude is the source of happiness. Absolutely. It's the other way around. Yeah, yeah. And you need to hear that. Uh, and I hope all of you out there hear that because yeah. it's important to realize that uh, when, we, when we talk to somebody like Flint who has been around for a long time in this business and he understands what the barriers of love are all about. And I want to, yeah. I want to touch upon that because okay. we only have a few minutes before our first break. Mm -hmm. But if you could explain a little bit about your theories on barriers of love. Well, I, I think we mentioned earlier, someone had asked me one time, you've been a therapist for a long time, been a Zen priest, what is it that you really do? And I heard myself say, well, I think I help soften or remove the barriers to love. And all that really means to, to me is help people relax the kind of tension or tightness that sometimes our conditioning, our past, our stresses, if those things can soften, then we have an open hand mm -hmm. that we can offer, and it's an open hand in which we can receive. And that's really the practical thing that I'm talking about. Can we just offer ourselves to each other and can we receive each other? It doesn't how have do you to get be... Away, how do you get away from the practical side of it, though? People, the stresses that people have in their lives uh, uh, creates barriers... Of course. ...from love or for love. How do you remove that? How, do you, how are you able to get people back on track again? Well, that's sometimes why I say it's about softening the barriers instead of removing them. Right. <laughs> uh, right. Um, it's through presence. If you can actually connect with someone, even in their uh, busiest and most stressful time, and you do this in your consulting, you do it in your teaching, if you can get their attention so suddenly they're with you, mm -hmm. then all that other begins to soften, it begins to, f to go into the background. Mm -hmm. I find uh, too many people I know have forgotten how to do that, Flint. They oh my gosh. really have. I mean, I see couples and friends who have been married for years and years and years, and they've lost it. You know, they've lost that, yeah. that ability to connect to each other. And it's such a shame. I mean, you know, my wife and I were sitting on the deck, and we try, I told you where we live, and we're sitting on the deck enjoying the sunset and just feeling how good it is to be alive, mm -hmm. you know, how feeling that connection that's there sitting on that, uh, you know, in that spot of mm -hmm. earth. And so grateful that you could. Absolutely. When I was um, about to do my TED Talk, somebody said, what do you want the result to be? I said, at the end, when I stop, what I want people to do is turn this way mm -hmm. instead of to their phone. Right. If they do that, then I've made my point. I think you're right. I, I, I find um, uh, eliminating uh, barriers, and I love that word, eliminating barriers, and that could be in business and personal lives and yeah. financial structures and in, in love, all that stuff. You eliminate those barriers and all of a sudden life becomes much easier. That's right. It's infused with a kind of an energy and a nourishment yes. that's always there, yeah. but we don't notice it because we get so caught up. Yeah, I agree. And that, agree. that is uh, really what we wake up to. It's amazing. Uh, Flint, we have to take a short break. Certainly. And then I want to talk about meditation. Okay. Because that is one of, people look at me and they say, Seymour, don't tell us you meditate. You don't have the personality <laughs> for meditating. You're too busy. Yeah, I'm too busy. I, I, you know, I wake up at four in the morning and I'm going mm -hmm. at 150 miles an hour. But yet I do meditate. And I want people to understand what the term really means. Okay. Because too many of us think of it, sure. uh, you know, looking at somebody in yeah. the corner, right? Uh, so we'll be back in a minute. We'll meditate during the break. Let's do it. Okay. All right. We've got 60 seconds to do it. Uh, I'm Seymour Kazimersky on the Seymour's World with Flint Sparks, our wonderful, wonderful guest, a Zen teacher, a psychologist, and I, I think he's going to be one of my very best friends. Be back in a minute. Hello, I'm Yukari Kunisue. I'm your host of the new Japanese language show on Think Tech Hawaii called Konnichiwa Hawaii. Broadcasting live every other Monday at 2 p.m. 
Please join us where we discuss important and useful information for the Japanese language community in Hawaii. The show will be all in Japanese. Hope you can join us every other Monday at 2 p.m. Aloha. Aloha, I'm Jay Fardell, founder of Think Tech Hawaii. And I'm Andrea Gabrielli, the host for Young Talents Making Way. Wait a minute. This is not a new, a new episode, is it, Jay? No, it's not a new episode. Um, you know, that show is over, Andrea. So uh, what are you going to do now? Hmm. Why don't we have a summer edition of Young Talents Making Way, where we focus more on education as a mean for our young talents to max out become role models and achieve their dreams. What a great idea. So when do you want to begin, Andrea? July the 3rd, 2018, Tuesday at 11 a.m. Young Talents Making Way, Summer Edition. Stay tuned. Hi, welcome back to Seymour's World on Think Tech Hawaii. If you listen to the first half of this show, you are probably just as mesmerized as I am by this young man, Flint Spark, sitting next to me. What an amazing individual, somebody who can basically explain life to you, explain love to you, explain how we should lead a better life, how we can make a difference. And by the way, uh, after the show, I'm going to be filming my commentary called How to Make a Difference. So Flint, we are back together again. And Great. the first half of the half of the show went too quick because we only answered one of the five <laughs> questions that I had for you. So I don't think we're going to be able to do them all. But one thing we, we ended off with was meditation. Yes. Um, um, Definition of meditation, please. I think the essence of meditation, or essence. aside from any different form of meditation, because there are many, is when you stop manipulating your experience in any way whatsoever. Now that's a counterintuitive definition, because many people think, oh, I'm going to meditate, so now I'm going to change what I'm doing. But meditation really is, in some ways, stopping. If we can be um, just grounded, sit here, but open and aware, not go inside or pull away, and be very deeply present with ourselves and each other, then uh, some people think of meditation as like fighting, like stopping your thinking or trying to slow. And if you're or emptying your mind, yeah. And, and if you do that, you know you're going to be at war with your mind forever because it doesn't stop. But there is a primary awareness that you can rest in. It's like uh, the sky outside when you're sitting on your deck. We were going to talk about that I in know. a second. So the clouds go through the sky. The sky doesn't get confused and think it's the clouds. What's going through it? But we get confused with the contents of our awareness. We, get, we hook onto the fear, we hook onto the worry, the planning, instead of resting in that space of, of awareness. And you can actually learn to remember to rest in the space in which everything is bubbling around and sitting and caught in what's bubbling. The bubbling can continue sometimes. Sometimes it slows down. Well, for me, meditation, as I said to you before the show, I go into the hot tub three days a week at 6 o'clock in the morning, and I'm there for half an hour. And you're right. I allow the bubbles to it's surround allowing. me. I allow the clouds to pass over me. I allow the trees and the birds to do their thing. And I find myself, after that half hour, so much more relaxed. Mm -hmm. I'm calling it meditating, and it may not have no. be the essence of what meditating is no, all you're about. you're talking about it. But to me, that's what it is. It's the, the ability, deep allowing. Right. And I think it has to be done on a fairly uh, um, a regular basis so that mm -hmm. people understand it's something that you can cultivate over a period of time. And I've been doing it for years, yeah. and I find that I miss it. If I'm out of town, for instance, and I don't have that half an hour to just, you could call it vegetate. I don't care what you want to call yeah. it. I'm calling it meditating. Of course. The ability to allow your mind to just totally relax, to totally forget about all of your ills and everything that's going on. You can't stop it from thinking. There's no, no. such thing. And even if you don't forget it all, you remember over time, because right. you do it a lot, that there is a space of clarity and simplicity that's always there, even if you're not touching it, but you remember it, and that you don't ever lose that, even though you might not be able to reach it every single time. But over time, you practice, 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 and you don't just cultivate a capacity, which you do. It also begins to actually change your physiology and your neurology in a way that things are more in alignment, 
more in balance right. and are much more healthy. It's so strange. Oh, and to all of you out there uh, who have sent me all these notes, oh, he's going to teach you how to meditate on the show. Well, he's not teaching me how to meditate on the show. He's validating that what I'm doing in the hot tub, what I'm doing in those moments are giving me a meditative state, a state mm -hmm. in which my mind is able to totally, totally relax and allow, as you said, physiology, it allows your mind and your body to leave that state a half hour in a much better state than it went into. Yeah, it's a it, portal. It's an opening. Right. And you know what your opening is. If we're just vegetating and hanging out, that's not meditation, that's Correct. resting. Correct. Correct. This has an attentive quality to it. Yeah. A, a quality of presence to it. Right. There's some energy, but it's not an energy that's grasping at anything. Correct. And that's what's really difficult for folks because we're so used to doing something for an instrumental gain. Right. And this is doing something without that and resting in the, the gratitude of, of the present moment and seeing what comes. And you know, one of the issues are, are that we as a society want definition. And you don't mm -hmm. want to define meditation as a certain way of thinking, a certain way of doing. It is an individual issue. It's an issue of how to do it. And again, uh, if you watched my commentary last week about happiness, and I told you to write things down about w one of the first two or three or four things uh, that you can do to be happier, one of those things that I had so many people talk about was meditating, mm -hmm. and I had not suggested it. I had not suggested it to you. And oh, it came up on its own. It came up on its own. I probably Probably of the 400 or 500 mm -hmm. people that, that commented, uh, probably at least 100 of them said, I wish I could meditate, meaning they know that their body and their mind needs this. They need to be able to I think what that totally is, feel it. that longing is something about, for most of us in this culture, a longing to rest, to be more quiet, to be more peaceful. Uh, and, but, but people don't really understand what it might mean. How would one do that? to actually rest, because it isn't just um, hanging out at the beach. Right. It's something about a deeper resting. Oh man, you are so on track. Uh -huh. And to those of you who I've sp been speaking to this about for the last uh, three or four years about how important it is to get the, you don't have to call it meditating if you don't want to, but I call it meditating. If you could do that, if you could get your mind and your body into a state like you're discussing right mm -hmm. now, uh, it is not that difficult. It's just a matter of practice slowly, even for five minutes, 10 minutes, and then you build up to it until you feel comfortable. And here's the warning label. You know, on the package, there's yes. always a warning label. Yep. As you quiet your mind and your body, as you sit still or open to everything, guess what's going to show up? Everything. Mm -hmm. And so sometimes in the beginning, people will say, well, actually, I'm more disturbed because now all these things are floating up that I kept at bay by being busy. So there are ways in which more things become available to you. That's the good news because now you can attend to them you can take better care of yourself. But at first, if you think it's like taking a pill that's gonna wipe everything out, that's a naive view of meditation. You're right. It's gonna open you to everything so that you can meet everything more fully. And over time, that's gonna transform your life, not just give you symptom relief from stress. And that's a big difference. Very, very big difference. I, 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 you're preaching to the choir here. I really, <laughs> I, I'm a real believer in yeah. the ability to allow your mind and your body to focus on what's most important at, yeah. at a period of time. Not everything. You can't do everything at one time. You have to be able to sift through some of the funnel, you know, stuff that you put in the funnel and decide this is what I want to work on. This is what I want yeah. my life's purpose to be. And as we mature. Notice I didn't say get older, but as we mature and also as we have challenges, which we spoke about, these are things that refine our view. We realize, oh, I, I don't have an infinite amount of time. Maybe I'm not going to achieve every single thing I thought I would. But as those things fall away, they can be deep disappointments or they can be openings and refreshment for something that you didn't even expect would happen. You're right. You're right. And those new things that happen to you, whether they be love, whether they be work opportunities, no matter what it is, can restart your life. It can make you feel much younger than you were before. Exactly. And totally unexpected. It's not, it wasn't in your plan. Right. It wasn't in my early plan to move to a strange little island in the middle of the Oh, well, we haven't even Archipelago. talked about that. I, know. I wanted to talk about it. But I do want to oh, yeah. bring up something. Sure. I came up with a saying, and I have it here. It says, focus on what you have, not 
what you don't have. Exactly. Now, that phrase by itself, how do we get people to do that? How do you focus on what you have and not wish I had this, wish I could, you know, the, 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 the wishing well is endless, right, because you always want more? Yeah. How do you focus on, on what you have, not what you don't have? Well, that's part of what meditation is about, mm -hmm. uh, because when you stop and you're not doing anything, all that's there is what you have. Mm -hmm. You're not going to be able to stop people from thinking about what they don't have. That, that's like um, human brains do that. Mm -hmm. But They're, it's also a choice issue as well. But, what, but do you put your energy into it and focus on it, or do you provide an antidote that is right next to it? Mm -hmm. Rather than fighting the longing, right. to say, okay, let's right next to it, let's appreciate what we have. Let's use gratitude mm -hmm. as a balancer. And what, what happens over time is that there's a generosity of spirit, there's an openness of heart, there's a quieting of your mind that begins to emerge when you put them together. So you're not fighting the acquisitional right. mode. Right. You're just offering an antidote right next to it, which begins to change the balance. It's so interesting because that leads into my last topic that we only have time for, and that's listening. Yes. How important is listening? How many people over talk to the other person? <laughs> and I happen to be very guilty of it. My wife, Sue, who's watching this show right now, can probably tell you how many times she said, you're over talking, you know, because my mind is going faster than my listening mode. Oh, gosh. And listening is the key. So I came up with something on listening that is, and I'm going to read it Let's to hear you, it. how to listen. It says, truly listening requires a person to fully disconnect himself from all other preoccupations and thoughts and make himself available to the other. You need to focus better. You need to shut out external visual stimuli and concentrate. When we listen and allow the words we hear to penetrate us, we make space for the other person. Right, and that space and that quality and that discipline that you're talking about, I would encapsulate in the word presence. Mm -hmm. um, because if I can allow other things to uh, not take such um, forefront in my attention, <laughs> that attention opens. And I can really look in your eyes, feel your, own, your body here, mm -hmm. be with you, uh, and be present with you. You're going to feel my presence. Mm -hmm. You're going to feel my attention. I do it now. Yeah. Yes, absolutely. And we listen to each other. We see each other. We feel each other. And that's the essence of really what I hope people are removing barriers to. Right. Because that's really the essence of, of care. I think once you remove the barriers, something pops in. It's natural. Gratitude. Yes. Compassion. Yes. Presence. All of these, all of these issues become part of people's lives, and it's something that I've been trying to struggle with myself, and mm -hmm. I think I'm getting there at my tender age. I'm starting to understand that that's a makes, lifelong thing. I know, and it makes me happier. There's it a, absolutely makes me. There happier. are four qualities, without going into sort of a, a Buddhist stuff, but there, there are four qualities that are talked about uh, in the in the way of maturing into one's spiritual practice. Mm -hmm. And they are essential qualities that are there that get opened. And they are compassion, the ability to meet suffering and not mm -hmm. turn away, uh, loving kindness, mm -hmm. which is unconditional friendliness, mm -hmm. um, equanimity, mm -hmm. a peacefulness, mm -hmm. and then the last is sympathetic joy, the happiness that comes from when the other person's happy. And those four qualities of compassion, loving kindness, equanimity, and sympathetic joy are what are in your definition. You're right. They're all there. You're right. I have to I, I, I have to say this, and I hate to say it, Flint, but we're at the end of our show. Oh, no. Yes. <laughs> Believe we're having too not. much fun. Uh, well, actually, we only did one. So uh, oh, well. we have five more topics to do. And I'm hoping we can continue this, because it has been, for me, a pleasure and sure. education and I, I, I just think for our audience in general, if they watch this show mm -hmm. and they just glean a little bit of it, they will have a better life. Well, maybe we'll have some more time together. I'm only an island away. Oh, thank you. Thank you. And you are coming to our Hanukkah party this year, right? We'll see I'm, about that. I'm, yeah, I'm, I'm, putting you on, I'm putting you on air that you're That's coming right. to our party. That's right. Thank you so much. Thank you, Seymour. I loved having you. It's a pleasure. You. Uh, absolutely loved having mm -hmm. you. For all of you out there, I will um, be back on August the 24th. I will not be here on August the 9th. I 
to leave. But I will be back on August 24th with a, uh, a guest and a new commentary as well. So today, I think I will probably get hundreds of comments as well, because Flint is an amazing, amazing individual and a man who I look up to as uh, my mentor. So aloha from Seymour's World on ThinkTech Hawaii. See you next month.